Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to this webinar today. Uh, if you can just give me a, a um, thumbs up uh, in the chat box or something, just say so you can hear me, which is great, and you can see the screen, we'll get cracking. Thanks so much, Roger, which is great. So today we're going to continue our theme on um, preparing for race season. It's getting close. Uh, I must say I'm really excited. I'm out on track um, quite soon myself. Uh, I'll be out uh uh, in a month or so, probably a little bit less, and uh, can't wait. But I'm sure we're all starting to think about, um, you know, how do we make sure that we're ready to go? And I think that there's a lot that we're doing right now to be able to get ourselves ready for race season in terms of the analysis we want to do and how we set up Race Studio 3 analysis. I think uh, the software was released in full production last year, but I think we've seen a lot of people transitioning to the new software this year. Um, as we prepare for this race season. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And in particular, we're going to talk about track maps and segment splits. It's one of those areas that uh, oftentimes doesn't get used, uh, but at the same time really does help uh, with analysis, because once you start getting the hang of how to be able to create your own segments and splits, it uh, really opens up the power of analysis with Race Studio 3 analysis. So that's the goal for today. Um, and uh, the other thing I will say is uh, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. At the moment, we are recording this, uh, which will go on to YouTube later on. So if you wouldn't mind keeping yourselves on mute, um, uh, unless, of course, at the end you have a question, that would be fantastic. That means that, uh, you know, just in case somebody comes in with a cup of tea or a question, um, that's not necessarily on the video for, for, for others to hear. Um, beyond that, uh, I didn't really introduce myself. I'm the generally the worst host there is on these sort of things. My name is James Coven. I uh, am a partner of AIM uh, and uh, have worked with AIM for many years, both in the US and the UK in many sorts of capacity, uh, mostly helping out with a lot of videos online. I have a YouTube channel where uh, I do a lot of uh, videos to be able to help people understand how to use various different softwares, of which AIM is one of them. And then similarly, been working with AIM Shop, AIM Technologies for the last few years, being able to do these webinars uh, once a month to be able to help people uh, with the use of the software. We are going to mix it up this year. We're going to change uh, the conversation. There's going to be some guest speakers who are going to come in. We're also going to talk uh, a lot about hardware setup as well. And we've been focusing a little bit more on software lately. And I think that's been important for a lot of people who've been transitioning to the new software. And we will feed it in uh, throughout the year. But uh, at the same time, please uh, stay tuned to other webinars that we do uh, because we'll cover many topics. Now, let's talk about today's topic in particular. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, track maps and a split overview. I'm just going to give a quick overview of what it is. We have actually covered this a little bit in the past, but it is something that comes up a lot when we do uh, feedback opportunities to ask people what they'd like to learn about. A lot of people are still interested in how to be able to use the track map uh, capabilities. Uh, more importantly than anything else, uh, cloning track maps. Now, this language may seem a little bit foreign right now. Cloning track maps, what does that mean? Uh, but uh, I want to talk through that because there's one big mistake that I've made a few times with setting up new tracks, which I want to help you all avoid uh, as we go forward. Uh, then we need to think about segment splits for purpose. We're going to do this uh, in many respects. It sounds like a strange uh, thing to say, but you can split the track up however you want it. Um, and as a result, if you take a track, I'm going to use a lot of Castle Coombe today, maybe use a bit of Silverstone, depending on where I've been and, and where it can relate to the conversation, you can look at different analysis based on what happens. And so I think it's important that uh, we focus there. Uh, how we include this in a user profile, we'll cover a little bit of that in the software today. How do I bring in uh, my segment splits into a user profile so that it's useful to be able to customize the profile for the splits? Uh, again, that makes sense. And then the last, which is really interesting. What if you want to be able to share a um, track map or a segment split with other machines that you own or friends or family? Sounds weird to say friends or family, but I know a lot of people who race together in terms of saying, all right, well, I've split the track up into a nice way. How do I share that uh, segment split with other people? So that's what we're going to have a look. Now, let's talk about why segment the track. It's, a, it's an important sort of conversation. Oftentimes, people allow the aim split to be able to operate within the parameters that they're looking at. I'm looking over there because I have the chat box. So if anyone asks any question, I can see what you ask. Um, but at the same time, one of the things is important is that depending on who you are and depending on the track that you're looking at, the way that aim splits the track up is 
I actually think very useful, yet at the same time can get overwhelming when you want to start looking at, well, it was split number one. And where is split number one? And where's split number two? And how does that work? So what we're going to look at today is uh, analyzing the car, the driver, the chassis maybe in terms of looking at specific areas on the track. And that's an important component. What do I want to have a look at in terms of specific areas on the track that said, let's say, for example, I want to have a look at a corner analysis. What's my minimum speed in that particular corner so I can get an idea in terms of consistency, all sorts of stuff like that. But by default, AIM gives you corners and uh, it's interesting, corners and straights. So the AIM software will split up the track so it will allow you to be able to see uh, the segmentation. Now I've put some examples here, but the first one I'm showing you here on the far left-hand side is a default that's set up by AIM. Everybody has this now. If you were using the old software, and if you're watching this on YouTube and um, or you're on the call right now and you're still using the older software that is there, uh, you have to actually go in and build a track map in uh, the map manager. Now, what that happens when the system builds that map is exactly what happens in an automated fashion now with the new Race Studio 3 analysis software. And effectively what happens is that AIM breaks the track down into effectively corners and straights. And it colors those corners according to whichever ones they are. So you can see here on the far left-hand side, that what's happened is green is a straight, red is a right hand, and then glue, glue, blue is a left hand uh, that moves in and it breaks the track into these different segments. So you can see what's happening and each one of them represents a different type of corner, but they're always the same, right? So blues are right and, and reds are left. And so you can see a lot of that in terms of a split that's been set up there by the system by default. Now, interestingly, you can then go in and then split that into user-defined segments. And so as we go through, I'm going to explain why I personally do this, and you can start thinking about it for you. And here's what's happened. Anyone who's driven this track, um, which is Castlecombe, knows that one of the uh, most technical corners on the track is an area called Quarry, which is this corner that's right here. And as you go through the corner, you actually start turning left, you straighten up, you go through a hill. And if you get your timing right or wrong, because you're going and cresting a hill, your wheels can lock up. You're already doing 100 and goodness knows what miles an hour. And it's also quite an intimidating variable. Plus, you want to hit your apex and get good exit speed out of here. And so it's a whole technical complex. And so for me, I like to look at that entire complex of corner in one area, because then when I do analysis, I basically break it down and tell myself, OK, you've got to do a better job in quarry not necessarily the breakdown of the left hand, the right hand part of that corner, just that one particular segment. Same thing with this particular corner here, which is camp. It's where you actually line up to be able to get into that corner and be able to make sure that you're representing your performance as you can understand on track. And that's important. One of the challenges with this is if I count up these number of segments, it, I believe, totals 13. Now, if I said to you, when you're driving at 90 miles an hour, Am I in sector 12 or 13? And can I remember what I was supposed to do in sector 12 or 13? Often adds an element of complexity, which is really difficult to be able to apply to when you're on track and when you're driving on track. So as you analyze the data, if you break it into user-defined segments, then that works specifically for you and your own components. Plus, this also allows you to be able to break it into different areas and different types of opportunity. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Now, other areas that we like to look at, and the reason there's no track map here is I'm actually going to build this with you because we can have a look at what this looks like, is that if you're, let's say, for example, many of us, I bet many of us are Formula One fans, or we watch V8 supercars in Australia, or we watch uh, GT racing or Le Mans, whatever we watch. Usually when we're looking at who's doing a great job in terms of the track segmentation and who's up or who's down in intermediate one or intermediate two, there is a defined by either the track or oftentimes I think it's FIA or whoever it is, there are intermediates that are set. Now, the reason this is interesting is that I've actually taken this screen grab from a TSL timing, which for those of you who may be watching this outside of the UK, TSL timing is a um, service that we use predominantly in the UK that allows us to be able to measure um, and report on live times and then session results and everything that you see uh, after the session. Well, in there, all of the competitors have their time broken down in particular intermediates. So if you wanted to do some immediate competitor research and be able to say, 
where is competitor X doing better than me in intermediate one? It's interesting to be able to say, well, I'm losing out in intermediate two. Then you can break the track map down into that particular area and you can look at your consistency and look at performance. And even if you don't have their data, which chances are we don't because it's a competition, we can still start using this to be able to understand how we're doing versus our competitors in those areas. And then even though we can see what our segment splits look like in a document that comes from TSL timing, it doesn't actually help us look at what we're doing as a driver, what our inputs were, what we did with our feet, what we did with our hands. That's where the data analysis comes into being able to really drill into, I'm losing out in sector two uh, by a, a segment of about half a second. That's where I focus my attention to be able to be competitive with others. So we're gonna have a look at setting one of those up. And then the last thing is, and I've just used one example here, but this is gonna help us with our profile analysis later, is thinking about a purpose as to why I want to split the tracker. Now, this user-defined area is really a variation of different purposes. This, for me, is generally set up for a driver performance analysis so that I can remember what I'm doing next time I go on track. However, braking analysis allows me to be able to then look at the track map and be able to say, can I just identify the areas on track where I'm braking? And then if I find that braking zone, can I do some specific analysis on each of those particular brake zones that not only will I see on the map now, but I'll also see in the way that AIM uh, Race Studio 3 has set up those particular segment splits. And so that's what we want to be able to work on. And that's what we're going to share today. And so hopefully this suits everyone in terms of the conversation, in terms of being able to look through. I don't know if we'll take the whole hour. If we do, great. If we don't, hopefully we all get a chance to have uh, an evening cup of tea sooner or something like that. So let's get into um, a live demonstration. So I'm going to open up um ooh, i'm gonna open up race studio 3 analysis let me just click on share the screen here and i'm gonna do that again uh please give me a yes if you can see this one that'd be great just uh, uh make sure i'm using zoom properly just so it records which would be good uh someone say yes or no hopefully you're seeing race studio 3 analysis we're going to guess that there's, uh, yes. yes, lovely, thumbs up. Thank you so much, Matt, appreciate that. So Race Studio 3 analysis, we're all here. Now, one of the things that I've deliberately not done today is I haven't updated my track maps. Now, one of the things that I think is really important for us to be able to analyze tracks and segments is to make sure we have the latest tracks from AIM. Now, this sounds like a strange thing. Would Why would tracks change? Why would things change in that sort of respect? Well, they do. We've seen, seen situations where start finishes have changed a little bit in terms of positioning. We've seen instances where there may be a slightly new layout. I used to race in the US, for example, and there is a track uh, called the Ridge Motorsport Park, and they've changed the um, last complex a little bit since I raced there. So I'd need the latest version of the track map to be able to make sure I've got the current version in terms of splits. All sorts of different things that happen. To be able to do that, it's important that we keep an update of all the tracks that are here. So the first thing I recommend that everyone do is just click here. And what it's going to do is if I hover over it, it tells me that new tracks have been added, uh, have been downloaded and need to be imported into the database. This is something that you probably see all the time, may ignore, but it's useful when you're updating your tracks. So if you click there, just click on import new tracks. It says importing. It takes a matter of seconds to be able to do. Well, I'm hoping it does based upon today's conversation. Otherwise, this could be a lengthy part of the demonstration. Usually it brings those tracks in quite quickly, uploads them into the system, and then it tells you you're ready to go in terms of being able to uh, operate going forward. Now, the reason that this is also important as we look at it is it also makes sure that the mapping part of that particular uh, track is, is sorted. So when we start thinking about track splits, we start thinking about distance, sometimes we can use GPS coordinates. Um, it allows us to be able to make sure we're at current and fresh. That's it. That's it's done. And we click on exit. And we actually don't need to go into this particular area anymore uh, to be able to manage the tracks. But it's useful to have that in the database as we go into the analysis. Now, as we all know, we need to click up here to Race Studio 3 Analysis. And it's all beautifully built into the new software now, which is nice. And the first thing we want to be able to do is to navigate to uh, a particular track or session we want to be able to work with. Now, there is a way of being able to check all your tracks up here. And so if you click here, you can see all your tracks that are available and open for whichever particular location that you're on. Uh, this shows a quick overview of uh, some of the aspects of um, the track as it's set up. This is using the RS3 splits and it's for whichever session I have 
uh, highlighted here. Interestingly, this is actually from iRacing because for the first time ever, and I've never had this before, there is an actual car that I drive in real life and in the sim racing. So one of the things that I've started to practice, and it may be a session that we do in the future, is how close is sim racing uh, with um, real life racing? And am I a lot braver in the sim environment where I'm not faced with the scenario where I'm actually going much faster than I, you know, than, than, than you know, fear would allow me to go? Whereas in a sim environment, I might just be throwing caution to the wind. So that might be a session for later on. But in any of these instances, I click on any of these, I click on Castle Coombe and I click here, it will change and show me that particular setup. But I don't want to look at it just here. What I actually want to have a look at it is when I've got the session open. So what I'm going to do, is I'm actually going to open this up. And the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see a profile that I've set up. If you've watched any of these webinars before, you've probably seen the profiles that I create and how my brain functions. Well, how my brain functions with data, that's a, uh, how my brain functions outside of that is, a, is, a, is, is, is uh, up for debate. But at the same time, as I look at data analysis, typically what we look at for me, as I look at data here, is that if I pick two laps, Usually what I look at is I look at um, speed. Uh, I look at what's happening in terms of time distance. Where was I good or where was I bad? You can see from an analysis point of view, you can see that uh, there was a particular issue in this particular corner here. The reason I'm mentioning this is this particular corner is something we want to be able to simplify. Um, then I look at why it happened and I look at what was happening with the speed. So you can see that the blue lap overslowed in this particular corner. And then I start looking at other variables in terms of what was I doing as a driver in that corner um, and uh, what happened to that particular area. So you can see here, I held the brake for a little bit longer. I broke sooner. I held the brake for longer. Uh, and as a result, I overslowed the car. And as a result, at that point, I slowed down and I'm about two and a bit, two tenths of a second slower in this particular area. That's what happened there. But here's the challenge, right? Here is when we start wanting to be able to look at some analysis in terms of being able to say, well, where was that on track? And how do we sort of start associating? And that's where these little bars make sense, uh, start coming in over here. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that AIM breaks the track down into aspects of straight right-hand turns, left-hand turns, and that then correlates into the way that this system is set up. And I think I mentioned there were 13 segments, but in this instance, you can see there's actually 15. So when I'm now starting to think, well, where exactly is that on track? It gets a little bit harder to be able to navigate. So one of the things that we might want to do is to be able to start understanding how to be able to manage our splits to be able to do that. Now, one of the things that we could do is we could go in here, and I may have shown you this in the past, and I'm not going to do it. I'm resisting the temptation to do it here because this is mistake number one that I personally have made more times than I care to mention is that I start changing the default mapping that AIM has set up for this particular track. And let me explain what I'm talking about there. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna click on this button. It's gonna open up the track maps. So here it is, this is the track map. This is the default that's coming from AIM. And you can see that here because it says RS3 splits. That's the stuff that the AIM software has created for this particular track. Now, one of the things that I could do is if I start messing with these particular areas up here, I am changing the default so if I ever want to go back to that particular original, there's a very, it's very difficult to go back to what the original default was set up. It's one of the things that I advise everyone to be able to resist the temptation to start playing with these particular adjustments here until such time as you have done what I'm about to do here, which is this process, which is if you click on this cog here and you click on this word to click on clone splits, if you click there, now you can say, I'm going to call this the AIM webinar. What it's going to do is it's going to create a new version of those particular splits. Now, if I click up here, it's identical, right? It looks exactly the same. And that's because I've cloned it or copied it so that I can start editing and working with it. Now, if I click on OK, it's going to prompt me to say, do I want to change the, the layout to these new splits, basically? This is what this prompt is saying. Do I want to change the way this map is set up to these new splits? Now, it's identical right now to how it was. So I have no issues in terms of saying yes. And the system is going to let me come back to this particular area and it looks the same. But the big difference is, is now I can start editing these particular corners without losing the aim default that's set up for that track. Now, you may be wondering, why do I want that default? And I personally always love having the original or the template 
to be able to work from going forward. And one of the other things which I actually find is really interesting is that the software will always determine where left and right and straights are by nature of where the car's moving on track. And so it's a nice template to be able to start with because one of the things I love with the AIM software as it builds the corners is that typically um, it's a great corner analysis. So as we start looking at some of these examples we looked at earlier, okay, well, what happened in corner number five? Well, this could be a nice analysis that we want to be able to have a look at here, which is what was my minimum speed in this corner, and then be able to break it down. So it's a good template to work with, but it's a bit complex. There's a lot to remember, and now we need to move it into that user-defined area. So we've talked about the aim, we've talked to the aim default, and it's nicely set up. But now we need to start thinking about, does this work for our particular purpose? Remember, we've cloned this, so we've always got the original to start with, which, which we want to. And so it means that we can start getting into this in a little bit more detail. Now, what do I mean by saying we want to make this specific to us? So I think you remember earlier I said, OK, well, uh, I don't really care that there's a slight kink in the straightaway because it's still the straightaway that's here. So I'd actually like this to be representative of the straight that is at the track. So if I click here, if I zoom down here, you can see where I am on track and what's happening here. So if I want this to be one single segment, I have an option now. So I can actually um, do one of two things. I can either right click on it. And if you've ever seen a webinar I've done before, I'm always talking about the beauty of right click. Well, right click is definitely a, an opportunity to be able to get into different areas. And if you click on unlock split management, you now get into the opportunity to be able to start working with your splits and turning them into opportunities. Now, the reason it says lock split is exactly what I just described earlier, which is you're going to start messing with uh, the original. But in this instance, I've unlocked it and now I can start looking at a certain area. Now, one thing I could do is I could remove them all. But that would make life a little bit tricky if I wanted to be able to merge some corner stuff together. So I'm not going to do it, but that's an option. But uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to first and foremost blend these together. So if I click on merge with the next split, now that turns into one giant split that's there, and that may represent the straightaway. Now I can right click on it and I can rename it. So I can now say that this is the straight. This is a nice new feature, by the way, for people who don't live in the US. It's lovely for people who do live in the US. And yes, I know some corners are called the corkscrew and some tracks have got corners with names. But typically when I raced in the US, corners were named were named were named with numbers. That doesn't even make sense. Corners were numbers. So you were advised to be able to learn the corner number so that when you're at Thunder Hill or you're at Laguna Seca or you're at Road Atlanta, it was, you know, well, how are you navigating through turn eight at Thunder Hill, which we all know is the biggest commitment corner that is there. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those things that we know numbers uh, for corners more so than when you're in the UK, we start finding ourselves in a scenario where a lot of our corners are actually not numbered, they're named. And so if I were at Brands Hatch and someone said, what are you doing in Graham Hill Bend or what are you doing in Druids? That's usually the language you use. So now we can right click on here and start to name the segments that we create more so than we necessarily have to use the corner numbers, which is a nice way to be able to do so. The other thing is, is that we also have the option here of moving it by dragging it. So if I don't really want uh, the segment to be here, I want to move it a little bit there. Um, the splits are locked right now. I need to unlock them. So if I, for example, just drag that, I can change the size of the split to be able to do so. Now, that's a nice feature to be able to just micro adjust. And I'm going to show you how useful this is a bit later on. Now, the last thing I want to do here is to decide how I want this to show up as a color. Now, if you remember I mentioned earlier, aim uh, judges right hand corners as blue, straights as green, left hands as red. But those colors are also useful if you just want to be able to break the track down into colors so you can split up a track map so it makes sense so you can see you're in a different segment. So for example, here I have the option of setting the split type. Now they'll always say it's corner one, two, or three, but you can call it, color it whatever you want with these. So I'm going to click on green because it's a straight. Now, the next thing I want to do is to get into that complex area of saying, okay, well, I don't really want every corner. I want a complex of corners. So here, if I drag this cursor, one of the things you can see here is it will drag this little dot down here to areas 
of where you are on the track. So I want to be able to judge in and out of uh, basically what is called quarry, because it's one of the corners that I'm terrible at. As you can see, my beautiful brake trace here is like just a zigzag of bad braking. Uh, but this obviously represents the fact that there's a big hill there as well. So it's brake going in, lift over the top of the hill and brake again, because if you broke over the top of the hill, you might find your car locking up and moving sideways. When I say you might, I have. And so this is probably why I'm braking poorly in that particular area. But it's interesting to have a look at that. Now, I want to break this into a certain area. So one of the best practices I would recommend to you as you start breaking your track up into different segments is to be in a position of saying, where do I break the track so that it's a consistent break every single corner and takes into account that there may be, we minimize the likelihood that there's slightly different driver inputs to certain areas. So let me qualify what that means. If I broke the track at exactly where I broke on one lap, but I happen to be a hesitation and I broke a little bit later on the next lap, then the variance of consistency between the inputs in that segment would be different. One, I would be flat on the accelerator. The other, I would have already started braking. And so the time variable would be inconsistent based on the fact that the driver inputs are inconsistent. So as you split your track up, one of the things that you may want to be able to think about is how do I break up the track so that there's consistency in the driver input so I can see consistency lap by lap. So to put that into context, Let's have a look at where this straight ends right now. So you can see right now I've got that straight ending here, but I'm still flat on the throttle. But at the same time, in both these areas, you can see I start breaking here. So if I want this straight to be representative of where that is, that's a good place to be able to put it. So I can actually just drag that over a little bit and move that particular straight. Have I got, I've got to unlock those, apologies. And I can move that over as I do so, and I can change where I've put that particular split that is there. That means that I am being consistent in every lap that I'm doing. It means that I can judge this better as I look at performance. Now, some of the other stuff I want to do is, well, am I consistently breaking there on every lap? Well, up here, I can select all laps and I can see where I'm potentially breaking. Now, there's a strange one there. That's probably the in and out lap or goodness knows what was going on on that lap. But if we look at this particular point, we know that there's consistency. There's inconsistency in breaking here a little bit. They're spread out but I'm breaking, I'm always on full throttle at this particular point, except for this particular area down here, which is probably the warm-up lap, which was actually the in-lap. So let's just take that out just to make life easier. Let's take out the out-lap as well. And so now we've got consistency and we can see where that's happening. Always consistent, that's a great place to have your splits. So one of the things I would recommend everyone think about is where you put your splits and make sure it's where you've got, <laughs> big pardon, consistent input. Uh, same thing with when you're coming out of the corner as well. Inconsistent throttle application would mean that the assessment of the corner would be compromised if some places are consistent and some are inconsistent. And so as a result, you can see here that we've got this in a certain place. I need to unlock that. And you can see that that's in that particular area there. So now I'm safe in knowing that the analysis of this particular segment is always going to be consistent because any variance in terms of performance in that corner is always going to be judged the same. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the best three laps. And anyone who doesn't know about this button here, this is a lovely button. This just allows you to quickly select through your three best laps, your best lap. It just allows you to quickly navigate through picking instead of having to go, was it this one or was it this one or was it this one? Nice feature up there. Just little things as we go through, I'll show you now. What I want to do here is I want to be able to right click on here, rename it, and now say this is quarry. That's the scary part of that. So now I've got straight, I've got quarry, and I can do this all the way through to be able to set up how I want to be able to move these around. For example, if I wanted to be able to put a marker here, I can right click and say, I want to um, split where the cursor is. And what it will do is it will split the track at that particular point. Other things that I can do as I go through is I can change colors, I can change variables, but I can set this up how I want to. Now you may be saying, well, so what? Well, this is where it starts getting interesting. And what I'm going to do just to show you um, uh, in, in essence of uh, how this works overall, I'm going to first go to my custom split. It's going to ask me, do I want to load this? I'm going to say, yes, I do. And what it's going to do is it's going to break that track down into the setup that I wanted for this particular track. So you can see I already started the conversation here with the straight. 
um, quarry, the S's, Old Paddock, which is another straight, Tower, Bob Eason Camp. Those are the main areas that I focus my attention on. You may be saying, well, that's nice. It's broken it into easy sections. You can look at a bit of analysis. But this is where we start thinking about the application of this as we go forward in terms of what does it mean for additional analysis? What can we do here? Now, the first thing is um, let's look at some of the features that we can see on track. Now, you may have always wondered what these particular numbers represent here. Well, these numbers represent how well you went through certain segments wherever the cursor is pointed. So you can see here, this is the straight, and this tells you in each of the laps how well you did in that particular segment, and it's colored to represent that area. Notice if I click here, it changes to blue, and it tells me the uh, performance there, same thing here, and so forth. That's the first thing to be able to have a look at. The next thing is, is once you've created a split and you want to deep dive into a certain area. So let's say, for example, I'm going to turn off the blue lap. I do that. You know, I do want to turn off the blue lap. I'm going to create the, the, the one there. I'll make these blue and green just for fun, because that's how I like to be able to see them. And you can see, uh, you know, certain pieces of information here as to how well one tourner did over the other. Now, you can see that this is where... <laughs> Interestingly, it's where we talked about quarry, and then that just sort of disappears the whole way through. But what I can do now is if I hover over this particular segment and I double click on it, it zooms into that particular area. So now you notice because I've double clicked there, it's zoomed into that one particular segment and it's allowed the map to zoom in. So I can see that particular area on my track map down here and I can start seeing my, my inputs for that particular corner alone and I can start doing some analysis where we can see, well, what happens is, well, the red lap is sort of doing better and then it slows and then it does better coming out of the corner <laughs> again, which is really interesting. So how does that apply to input at this particular corner? Well, you can see that uh, the red lap breaks sooner, uh, the blue lap breaks later, comes off the throttle later, which is great. However, one of the things that you also notice is that the uh, red lap um, sort of comes off the brake sooner gets on the throttle sooner, carries a bit more speed through the corner, and then all of a sudden. So you would argue of anyone who's been to any racing school or anything of those sort of scenarios, this looks like a classic case of fast in, slow out, which is I've charged this corner. Um, you can see that I had a little bit of wobble with the steering wheel going through here, which might have been that aspect of, as I said, going over the crest of the hill, made car do all sorts of things, um, and, and see from there. Now, if you want to be able to see if that's actually true what was happening we also have the option of doing this and we can go in now i apologize to all of you who are saying well hold on a second why are there four uh videos here um it's because i was running two smarty cams that day doing a side-by-side -side comparison of a smarty cam 2 versus a smarty cam 3. so if you're looking at all of these on screen you may be wondering well there's a lot of them that are there for me to be able to work on but if we just look we can also see what happened in relation to performance in the corner. So if I start to scroll and I start to see where that's going, it just needs a bit of time potentially to catch up. Um, you'll be able to start seeing with the fact you've got video and data overlaid, you can start seeing what's going on, which is a quite a nice feature to be able to have. This seems to have got a teeny weeny bit stuck here. So bear with me while we look at that. But in essence, that's the concept that we want to be able to work through uh, in terms of breaking the split up. Now, I actually went back to the wrong section got ahead of myself in terms of my delivery here, in that uh, one of the things that uh, we also want to be able to have a look at is can we break that information into more detail? Because I wanted to have a look at the quarry corner that is here, one of the other things that I can actually do is I can start breaking that corner down into a little bit more detail. And so you can see here that we actually have all of my laps going into that corner, and I could hover over these and it's not. So bear with me one second while I turn this off and I turn it back on again. Um, someone's mentioned as well, uh, the uh, corners at the Nordschleife, uh, absolutely, by the way, I'm just going to turn this off and uh, start it just again, because it seems to got mildly stuck. And I apologize for that. Are you seeing Race Studio 3 analysis again, or Race Studio 3? Just a yes would be great on screen, which would be fab.
Okay, so how long was I presenting while nothing was happening? Can everyone hear me again now? About one minute. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad we're recording again. I apologize to all of you for that. Zoom crashed. Um, so uh, just one of those things that seems to happen. But we're all back again now, which is great. And so I'm just going to go back and share ratio three. So only about one minute, which is fantastic, which means I wasn't talking to you for about 20 minutes without it working. So I'm going to go back here, load this up, and we can go back to this sort of discussion. And so where were we? So let's just make sure I'm here. Click on here, share screen. And I'm going to click on race 33. So this, I believe, is where we were. If you can all confirm this is where I left off, uh, that would be great. Locked right up when race 33 locked up. OK, thank you, which is great. Uh, now we know uh, what happened, which is good. And so uh, fantastic. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dig back into that particular area. Now, one of the things that I said earlier on is if you double click, this is a scary area. I'm going to pick those laps again. It's funny how I describe laps as scary areas. I don't think some people probably look at them that way. Maybe it's just the way I look at sort of driving in general. It makes me also wonder whether I should do racing from time to time. But at the same time, if I double click in here, we were talking earlier about the fact that um, one lap um, is better than the other and we can go into data and movies. But what we can also do is we can start clicking on different areas in the system. So I've double clicked on quarry here in the time distance. But if I go to the track map, now I can start to look at certain performance in each of the corners. And I can look at now that segment broken down into lines, which is nice. And so this is just a profile of setup looking at lines, which is nice. And you can see sort of certain aspects here of going through this particular corner. Now, this is one that didn't record. That's a GPS glitch. Um, I do believe that's on that particular area as I was recording this uh, on that day. But you can see as you go through, relatively consistent, except for the outlap, which is understandable because it's the first lap and you've got... 25 Formula Fords all fighting for the same speed going into that corner, which is always a delight. Um, but at the same time, it probably indication why that's slow, but everything else is relatively consistent there, which is nice to see. But I've set it up from that point of view. Now, the reason that I love setting this up more than anything else is that I am a confidence driver. If I feel confident that I can do something, then I'll go out and do it. I have to sort of build up my confidence in the driver. I don't know how many of you feel the same way, but it's something I need to develop over time. One of the tools that I use to be able to do that is the split times report. And so because I've broken this track down into different segments, now I have the ability to see all of the lap performance for each of those areas. And it also allows me to be able to get an understanding of how I could go if I was doing well on that track as well. And so you get your best theoretical. So what it means is that because I've broken the track down into segments that are digestible for me, I know that I've done something in a corner that I can absolutely tangibly understand, like tower, for example, or camp, all corners that I can understand I've set up. It means that I know that if for some reason I've consistently gone through there and then all of a sudden I've dropped down at a certain point, I can look at what I did in the data and say, okay, well, I've done it once, can I do it again? And I've got the confidence to know that I've already done it from that point of view. So that's a key sort of area. And then the last thing is, is we also have the data and movies option, which I'm not going to go through in detail right now, just in case from a, from a demo point of view. And I would imagine it crashed because I'm actually being overly ambitious and having too many smarty cams uh, running at the same time. So that just gives you sort of like the first basis of the sort of the breaking in the track down into certain areas, which is there. Now, what I wanted to also show is I wanted to show a few other things which I think are useful. So I wanted to go back here to this particular area and start looking at different sort of aspects of the track. Now, what we've looked at is we looked at the segments created by AIM. We've looked at user generated segments of which I've named mine up and, and put them in here, which is one here. The next one I want to talk about is uh, track segments for purpose. And so let's look at this from a break zone point of view. So I'm going to click on this one and notice how I've changed the track. So there's only red and green sections, and I only want to focus my attention on the green sections here. So if I open this one and I say, do I want to load it for this particular track? What I've done here is I've gone into each of the break zones and I've highlighted them and I've created segments for that. So zone one, two, three, these don't show up here, but that's okay, they're named four and five. And if you ever wonder why I've done it in that area and how do I know their break zones? Well, I've mapped it to where the braking activity is. So it's either let off the throttle here and where the brake is applied, where the brake is applied. And so you can see that I've set it up for that particular reason. 
Now what I've done in this instance is I've said, okay, well, I want to be able to start doing some analysis just to the break zone. How good am I through these break zones? What is the performance? Am I consistent? Where's this inconsistency? Where can I do better? Don't care about anything else. I just want to start looking at how what I'm doing in a breaking fashion. So what I've done here is I've gone in and I've created a profile called breaking zone analysis. So if I click on here, I've now loaded a map, which is specific to break zone analysis. This just represents the whole track right now. But if I start looking down here, and what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to click the space bar to give me small screen real estate here. If you're wondering how I've done that, you should go back to previous videos where we've talked about setting up user profile, because you can go in and understand how you can make the screen behave based upon what you ask it to do with things like the space bar, uh, which is nice. So I've set this up and I want to be able to have a look at how am I breaking in certain areas. Here I've added in certain key parameters that I want to have a look at in relation to um, the brakes uh, on the car. Now, I don't want to see anything in the straights because that doesn't help me, but I do want to have a look in a brake zone. So I'm going to double click here. This is uh, braking for tower, which is here. I can zoom out and show you where that is. This is the segment that I've set up. This is how it looks, and I can see where I am on track in terms of braking. And one of the things that's immediately interesting that happens on here is you can see as I hover over here, my position on track is different in nearly every lap, which I think is actually quite interesting. And then what I've done is I've also put in brake pressure analysis and I put in GPS longitudinal that shows me what I'm doing. So now what I can do is I can then say, well, let's pick the best five laps. That will give me consistency. It always goes back here. So you just double click and it gives you an opportunity of going back to that particular zone. Now I can start seeing my consistency through that particular corner. This will show me all of the laps that I've highlighted in terms of how I've done through that corner. Notice a lot of different lines, a lot of different inconsistencies that are through that particular corner, which are interesting. Is that an influence? Is that an impact in terms of, of racing? Also, it's interesting when we look at the brake application. Earlier on, I said, was the application of brakes for me in a particular corner based upon hitting the brake, lifting to go over hill and braking? Well, this corner doesn't have that, and I've still got a little lift here. So what's going on there? Is that a blip of the throttle if I'm trying to heel toe? Whatever's happening there, this allows me to dig into that brake zone and be able to see what I'm doing. And then this just shows me what my brake trace looks like in terms of brake and then transition off the brake. So it's a nice way of being able to have a look at certain aspects. Then the other thing I can also see is how's my car working in relation to how the brakes are engaging, what the bias looks like, um, what the minimum speed is that I sort of get down to in the corner. It just allows me, I'm not going to go into the detail too much here. But what I've done is I've broken the track down into brake zones and then created a specific profile just for analyzing my braking in those zones to be able to focus on one particular area going forward. So if I know from coaching, from feedback, from anything that I see that it's really inconsistency on the brake pedal that is making me lose time in corners, this allows me to dig into exactly what I'm doing and be able to focus on certain aspects. What I've also done here is I've applied some other information as well. For example, I've also looked at tire temperatures. And do we see a variance in terms of bias based upon the heat that goes into the tires? And what's interesting is, is that you actually see the bias work better on the rear tires as the tires heat up. And so that means that, for example, would I be prudent in using the brake bias adjuster that I have in the car and adjusting it as there is temperature that gets into the brakes because uh, into the tires? Because as the tires warm up, the rear brakes grip better. Makes sense, right? Stickier tires at the back makes the class slow down better. And is that indicative of something? Now, there's no necessary conclusive, conclusive information I'm looking at here, but it allows me to be able to get in and start testing and seeing what's happening and how I'm seeing set performance going forward. So just an interesting thing to be able to have a look at in terms of setting up a track map for purpose. And all I did was adjust those little variables by going in here, clicking on this button, which was the original. Remember, I always want to change the original clicking on clone and actually going in and creating a new setup, which in this instance was set up just for the brake zones that are there. So again, don't feel like just because you've got default 15 segments, that's how you're going to analyze your data. You can do this in all sorts of different ways. Now, the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to click on cancel there, is I'm going to um, focus on the last of the objectives I wanted to cover in today's webinar was setting up a track using similar splits 
that are created um, when you look at intermediates. Now, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to close this one, and I'm actually going to use Silverstone. Now, the first thing you'll notice when I open Silverstone is, remember earlier I said I've been making mistakes. Um, I generally tend to make a lot of mistakes. I'm just going to put driver analysis on to start with. Well, the mistake I made here is that I've created all these segments. Makes sense. And again, named corners. Anyone's interested in the UK, we we'll always do our named corners. And I've set it up how I wanted it for uh, driver analysis at Silverstone. Now, if I go into here, one of the things you'll notice is the RS3 splits are these splits. And what I've actually inadvertently done is I have overwritten the master file that came in from AIM. And so it means that I've lost all of the automatic segments. Now, I need to do research to see how you get those back. Um, and I don't know if it's something, I haven't found an easy way of doing it. If you do know of an easy way to do it, please share it with everyone here because it's a uh, uh, an interesting sort of dynamic. However, um, what I wanna do now is I wanna say, okay, make mistake made, no worries, I'm gonna move forward. And what I wanna do here is I wanna click on this and I wanna create a new. So I'm gonna click on clone splits and I create a new one and I'm gonna call this intermediates. And I'm gonna click on okay. I'm going to click on there and it's going to say, do you want Silverstone National for all the session on that day? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Change it up as much as you want because I can always go back to the other one uh, if I need to. And so what I'm going to do now is I am going to bring in, I'm going to open it up here. Hold on just one second while it loads. And I'm going to bring it over here. So I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm just going to share whole of screen too, so you should see all our happy faces. So hopefully now you should see this PDF. Now this PDF has come in from um, TSL timing, and so this is a this is a profile. Uh, sorry, this is a, a, a Walter Hayes Trophy, 100 and, I think 130 odd cars at one point, broken down into a full day of fantastic racing. If I scroll down on this document, the second page shows. Finish line, intermediate one, intermediate two. What it also gives me is the distance in terms of time on that track as to where that happens. So here you'll notice that it says, and hopefully you're all seeing this. Can you say yes if you are, just to make sure, because uh, I'm a bit a bit nervous about sharing stuff. Thank you very much. So what I'm seeing here is it's 800 meters um, that uh, is intermediate one. So I'm just going to write that down here so I don't have to keep going back to this. And the next one is um, 1,000 669 meters 1.6 kilometers in is 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 uh is is intermediate two now what i'm going to do is I'm going to go back to race studio three and i'm going to right click on here unlock the splits i'm going to right click again and i'm going to remove all splits so just got one big one that's here now and you're like okay that's not helpful um, and it goes back to the default of what the first one is and so you can see that it's actually put into woodcut or the, the the split that i had the marker in but that doesn't matter what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus your attention up here to notice this number characteristic here. That's just the distance of where you are on track. And as I move the cursor, this is how far you've gone around the track, right? So all I need to do is to scroll up to this particular point here. And first, I'm going to find 800 meters. So interestingly, the split is actually during a break zone. So it's interesting that there may be inconsistencies here overall in terms of laps. If I right click on here, I can divide the split at that particular point, and I want to drag it back over here. I could have done it where the cursor was as well. But what I've done there is I create the first split, and that's exactly where that is. Oh, nearest makes a difference. Let me just get that exactly where I want it to be, like this. This could be a long demo, so I won't go into You get what I'm saying in terms of doing. So that is um, uh, sort of one. We can call it one. We leave it that color. The next was at 1,669 meters. So scroll over 1,669, which is around about, doo -doo 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 -doo. I said, uh, there we go, not oh, close enough. Right click here in the box, um, divide split at the cursor point, which uh, didn't work at that point. So I'm just gonna click on divide splits here. I'm gonna bring that one in. And that's exactly where that one is. Now that's number two. Now I actually might want that one just to be blue. And then I can rename this one. Uh, three. Or you could do intermediate, or you could do sector, whatever need be. But now what I've done is I have created a track map that mirrors all of the data that I would have received from my competitors 
in that document, that booklet we showed, so after you've run session one, it's going to say all the fast drivers in Formula Ford, of which I consider every other person but me, um, is doing X, Y, or Z in sector one, two, or three. So if I know, looking at the lap time, that I'm quite consistent with them in lap one, and I'm quite consistent in sector three, but sector two, I've got areas to be able to work on in terms of inconsistency. That's where I'll focus my attention in terms of being able to look at driver enhancement, driver driver opportunities of being able to improve my overall performance. And so it's a simple way of being able to use the segment splits, but use it in a way that you can use other resources to be able to overall improve your performance on track by using it for a little bit of competitive research, by just being a little bit smart with how you split the track up. Then as you go back into the split times report, you get your one, two, and three, you can look at your consistency. And if I were looking at this and I looked at number two, that's actually quite good, except for as I look down here, I'm like, all right, that's not bad. Yeah, it's a bit inconsistent. And if you're wondering how I'm judging that, it's based upon what I was taught by Roger Goodell, who's the, the training manager for AIM in the US years ago, which is you're looking for noisy bits. This bit altogether here, that's noisy, noisy, that's nice and consistent. But where the lines are all over the place, that's noisy. And when that's noisy, it's inconsistent. And if it's inconsistent, it means that you're not doing a good job of being consistent in that particular area. And so how do you improve that overall performance going forward? The same thing as if I looked at this particular sector three, if I look at uh, certain corners here, you can see uh, that uh, chances are, yeah, it's inconsistent going on. Look at that one going into that corner. They're very inconsistent in terms of what's going on. Again, areas to improve coming out again, not quite as bad going in. Ooh, very ugly. And so in that instance, I've used the opportunity to be able to break the track down into different splits to be able to understand how I'm doing versus my competition. And then I can add other variables and just look at different aspects. And this one, this is a fascinating one because there are many different lines through this corner, but you can see how many of them I've managed to take. And I think I found nearly every single one of them, but inconsistently in one session. And so you can see that you can start looking at different data. And so with that, knowing that we've got about five or so minutes left of today's session, I am going to stop sharing. And I'm going to see if there are any questions that anyone has based on what we've seen today. And you can ask the question, but easier if you want to just write the question in the question box, I can help answer if need be that as well. Oh, one thing I didn't show you. You probably were thinking, well, you missed a section here, James. And I did. So let me go back and just share one more time with you, just so you can see what I'm talking about. Back in Race Studio 3 analysis. And what I wanted to also show is one last thing. And it's the thing that I said I would do and I didn't do. And I apologize to you all. If you've created track sections and you want to be able to share them with others or you want to be able to share them with other machines or whatever need be, you can import and export. All you need to do is click on the cl the clog, clog, <laughs> as if we were doing this in uh, in the Netherlands. You can click on this one here, and it's a cog, and you can actually click on here, and it says export the splits division. If I click on this, I can name it anything I want. I can say, for example, I want to go on the desktop, and this is the AIM webinar. I can click on save. Now I've exported that. Now if I want to be able to bring that in. All you need to do, and this is this this is I've been asked a few times about this. So I want to be able to show you just so you can say, okay, well, that's useful. Instead of clicking here, where's the import button? Well, the import button is at the track level. So if you go up here, import, import existing split from a, a split from a disk, click on what we just did there. I've already got it in there, so I don't need to load it. So you have that option. So if you're using multiple machines, you want to save splits that you've created to put elsewhere or be able to manage, you have the option of being able to bring them in and out of certain different areas so that you don't feel like, oh, I've got a new laptop or I've got multiple laptops. I use a desktop here and then I have a laptop that I have at the track. And so if I want consistency here, I have the option of being able to use different areas. And I don't use all the same profiles when I'm at the track. My ultimate goal with data is basically go in, get the analysis done, understand what's happening with the car, understand what's happening with the driver, get it analyzed, get it done, move on to the next session. Whereas when I'm home, I've got all sorts of other stuff. I look at my detailed brake analysis and those sort of things. So anyway, just wanted to show you that particular feature there as well. So I'm going to click stop share. And um, a question that we've got here. Why does it say track not compatible with selected session when clicking the track map and selected sectors? Not seen that message yet. I don't know. 
uh, is the honest answer, but uh, we can find out. And so what I would recommend is type, uh, I'll type in its support at uh, uh, AIM Technologies, or you can always email me and I'll forward you over to the right people. And uh, oh, Roger says he can help as well. If you want to come off mute, Roger, you can help on that one. That'd be great as well. I have seen that a couple of times. Thank you, James. You're doing a great job. I really enjoy watching these every every time you do them. Um, you. The if it says it does not is not compatible, when you bring your data into AIM and you open it in Ray Studio three analysis, it always compares your exact driven line with the map that is saved. And if you are have deviated, if there's a chicane or a different part of the track that is uh, you drove compared to the map you're trying to load it says that track is not compatible with that selected session. So it's uh, it's very closely tracking where you've gone. Maybe if it's a small chicane, it'll still be okay. But if it's uh, if you've deviated from the actual stored track configuration that you're trying to load, it will give you that message. And is there okay. a recommended route around that? Do you upload the track maps again or track segments or create a new track from that map? If, it, if, if you're running on something that AIM does not have stored in the track database, a configuration from Silverstone, let's say, then you end up, uh, you can build a new map. And whenever, if you have to do that, uh, please, please, please send it into the maps at aimsports.com so they can add it to the database so this doesn't happen to anybody else. If, if, uh, if you're just trying to load one that's not the right one, just go in and it is in the AIM database, you're able to go into the AIM database and select the correct configuration. Excellent. Yeah, can you, I think that can if you, you hear me? Send, sorry, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, so I, I, it's for Streets of Willow Springs in Southern California, and it's for Auto Club Speedway in Southern California. And we were running just the motorcycle course. And when I look at my laps from my sessions, it's overlaid on the course that's already in AIM pretty accurately. And I, I didn't deviate or run off track or anything like that. So I tried both of those while we were while we were on the webinar and neither and both of them give me that message track is not compatible with selected sessions. Yeah. Hard, hard for me to say then Ben, but if you would, uh, if you share it with me, uh, I happen to be working on button willow and willow Springs right now, making sure the configurations are all correct. Uh, okay. so, so ironically, what one of the ones you're working on, um, give me a buzz email wise, just Roger at aimsports.com. I will happy to help you make sure that track works for you. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you both. No problem. Brilliant. I love that. And thank you so much, Roger. I appreciate you answering that. I know it's uh, it's it's your a, 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 a viewer as much as anything else, which I, I appreciate the feedback. Brilliant. Well, we're at seven o'clock um, and uh, I've put support at aimtechnologies.com and uh, my email, which is uh, cobramjames at hotmail.com. If you want to be able to reach out to me, if you've got any questions uh, from this particular session. Um, and uh, with that, uh, unless anyone else has any questions they want to write into their box right now, I'm going to wish you all a very enjoyable evening. Going to end the webinar there, but we will hang around just for a little bit longer, just in case there's a couple of questions the last couple of minutes. But other than that, thank you so much for being here and look out for next week. I think the next webinar we're going to do, fingers crossed, is going to be um, working with some of the new Smarty Cams that are out. I've already done one on the Smarty Cam 3 Sport but there's some new dual cameras that are out and all sorts of stuff to be able to work with. So we're going to look at a bit of configuration of hardware for the next one, but at the same time, um, keep an eye because there's going to be different stuff all year. Hey, James, I have a quick question for you. Sure. On ahead. your on your profiles, can that same profile be imported to run on an oval track? Uh, I would think absolutely, yes. So the profile, well... Let's go I take a step back. The profiles that I create are usually custom to the devices I have in my car. So some of the channels are consistent. Um, GPS channels, lowest common denominator, we all have them. Whereas some of the channels that we have set up are unique to my particular device. So my naming or my brake pedal or whatever need be. So yes is the answer. The profiles will load but you may need to change the channels to represent what channels are coming in from your particular device. So how you set up your hardware uh, to be able to do so. But nearly every segment, every profile can be shared and then downloaded and shared with others. That's that's not a problem at all in, in terms of, and if there was one that you saw on there, you're like, oh, I'd like to have a look at that. Just drop me a note and I'll, I'll, I'm, I've, I don't have any issues with sharing all my stuff. I'm, I'm happy to share any of the profiles I've created. Okay, thank you.
Um, good uh, and no problem. And and it's lovely that people are sort of. Yeah, I agree, Scott. Dabbling and playing around with stuff. It's it's how I learn all the things. The sort of like the the curiosity, the right clicks, the cogs, the spanners, and the wrenches, and all sorts of stuff. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always a good way of doing it. So uh, thank you. Well, brilliant. Um, thank you to all of you. Um, I'm going to end it now uh, so that uh, it starts recording. It can go onto YouTube. But as I said, um, it was uh, Roger at Aim Sports. I'll just write it here for you, uh, Ben, just so you've got it. Um, yeah, I'll send it through to you, uh, Roger at Aim Sports. Okay. Which is good. So Roger's email is there. I sent that to you as well. So good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you again next time around.